Hi, welcome to Faster Forward here live on YouTube and Facebook. And with me is Naomi Novik, the award-winning, best-selling author who's got a new book out right now. Naomi, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you, Greg. Be here yet again. This is a yes. new, a new style of doing it, but the same, absolutely, same good conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's always fun to hang with you. So this will be fun. Um, first off, how are you doing? How's the pandemic treating you? Uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of a strange time, I think. But yeah, you know, that's I, I think that's true for all of us. Um, yeah. Just so you know, I tested negative for COVID on Friday. Well, I'm glad, you know, I think, I think we're probably sufficiently socially distanced here. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Um, so you've got a new book, Deadly Education, that came out just recently yeah. during all this. What's that been like having a, yeah, there it is, have, having a, you know, a book opening during all this craziness? You know, it was a little bit nerve wracking, um, obviously, especially a little bit, you know, the thing is, right, I, I personally try quite hard not to think about numbers, right? I, I don't actually keep track of numbers myself. And the only thing that I care about, you know, numbers by sales wise is I ask my editor and my publisher, are you happy? And if they're happy, that means great, I can keep doing this. And then I don't need, then I'm not worried. Um, but obviously with the pandemic, I feel like, you know, back in March, nobody had a clue. And in fact, it turns out not to particularly have hurt book sales. Um, however, obviously in the long term, it's hurt independent bookstores tremendously. And I'm so worried about, you know, we've lost one of, uh, we've lost actually two. Um, local independent bookstores here in the city at a moment where ending bookstores were having this wonderful resurgence and new ones were opening. Uh, and so that really hurts as an author and as somebody who just is also a reader and loves bookstores. I mean, I, I like being in bookstores even when I don't literally have time to read and can't, and I'm not allowed to buy more books because I'm going to be, you know, buried under the, <laughs> under an avalanche at some point. Um, and so, so it was a little stressful uh, for that reason. And obviously on the promotional side, on the promotional side, for me at least, I have experienced it in a couple of different ways. One is I miss actually going to bookstores and seeing readers and meeting people in person. That kind of, there's a human contact that you get uh, from being in a room with people who are engaged readers and either have read your book or are excited to read your book. Uh, and I miss that. I miss the conventions. You know, I just, I love going, to, I love San Diego Comic Con. I'm so sad to have missed it. New York Comic Con. Um, you know, the very first, I was literally just before lockdown happened, I was, I think, two days away from getting on a plane to Emerald City Comic Con. And, and then they were like, and now we've decided that's probably not a good idea, um, which they were correct. And in fact, you know, it was sort of like, uh, it, it, is, this is not a good idea. But the flip side is, right, that I've done a lot of these virtual events and virtual signings. And there's so many people who come to them who say, I could not have done this if it was not in person. And I felt, in fact, I think I felt quite strongly for at least the last two, three years, that a lot of promo um, should be moving online, that a lot of this stuff should be happening um, virtually, not least because, you know, flying around to like seven cities in 10 days, it just, it feels, it, it's, it's exhausting. Um, it also feels, you know, wasteful in a way. Uh, and, at the same time, you know, you want to to have to have that contact, but I feel like there should be a balance. And so for me, the silver lining of all this is that we've been forced to learn how to do this and how to do it well. 
um, how to do virtual signings, how to do virtual bookstore conversations. We all now know how to kind of participate in a virtual event in ways that I think people really didn't. And you wouldn't, fit, you, you need to be pushed by necessity sometimes to figure these things out because otherwise it's just, it's work that you don't have to do. And so you don't do it because there's so much other work that you do have to do, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah. It does save so anyway, me some time. Yeah. Uh, well, since we're talking about putting more publicity for the book, let's talk a little bit about uh, the new book, Deadly Education. Yeah. It is, once again, a new kind of genre for you. Mm -hmm. You've gone from alternate history and Napoleonic War to uh, Polish folklore to fairy tale. Mm -hmm. you know, taking off on fairy tales. And again, you're taking something that's been around and doing a little twist on it. This time it's the wizard school. Yeah. Because uh, the Scalamance, it, it ain't Hogwarts. <laughs> no. Although, although then, honestly, you know, it's, it's in many ways about me reacting to Hogwarts, <laughs> right? I, you know, that I obviously you know, this book actually is not, for me at least, right, I will say that I do think there's a commonality among my work, which is that I like having conversations. Uh, I like, and I mean, artistic conversations, in a sense, I like to s talk to a work, to something that I love, and something that I'm passionate and interested in. And, you know, the same way that a good conversation sort of flows and rambles and ends up very far from where you started. I think that's often what's happening with my work. And it's just, you know, what I'm talking about, the topics of the conversation are different. Um, but the spirit of it, the spirit of, I think, questioning and um, playfulness and, uh, and sort of interrogating questions um, deeply and engaging things, that's all, that is all to me quite fundamental to the way that I engage with text as a reader. And that's, you know, obviously I started as a fanfic writer um, and that's always been my primary motivation for writing is to sort of explore questions, explore something that I'm passionate about. Which is always good. Uh, we have a question from a viewer. Want to know how many books do you have planned for the Scala Man series? Uh, it's it's not just a plan. Um, it's three books. This is from Santa Z, by the way. Yes. Um, Another Z person. Good. Yes. Yes, we like the Zs. Um, yeah. The so the uh, the Scala Man's trilogy. It's a trilogy, and it was originally meant to be a duology. Um, and then I wrote the first book and discovered that it ended where I did not expect it to end. Um, but I basically, before book one came out, I'd already drafted quite a far, book two was, was about 70% drafted and book three had been started. So I knew where, before, before it came out, right? And now I'm finishing up book two and hoping to do as much as I can of book three before book two, before we sort of close the door on book two. Um, and that's because one of the things that I really, you know, after I finished Temeraire and moved to writing Uprooted and Spinning Silver, which were both standalones, I really want to, to see the end I really wanted to kind of know where I was going because that tells me what my story is about in many ways. And at the same time, I'm a discovery writer. I don't know where I'm going. Uh, and I always, I always let the characters and the story win when there's a question, you know, if I have a plan, the plan is never, I never stick to the plan. I don't, I don't value the plan for its own sake. That makes that makes sense for the kind of writing you do. Yeah. Yeah. So oh Scholomance, by the way, I was very surprised to find out that this is something else you've taken from folklore. That yes, this is from yes, Transylvania yes. folklore and is actually in Dracula, which mm -hmm. surprised me because I've read Dracula two or three times so, and I don't 
remember yeah. it. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. Um, and in fact, so uh, in fact, the, and the thing is, um, so it's kind of, you know, this is the thing right? when you talk about your sources, when you talk about inspirations, um, I did not read the original book in which the Skullamont's legend was, you know, described in English. Um, I read it in in this when I was oh. years old, um, and I found. Um, I have to find the page. Here it is. Goes to find the page. Yes, as you can possibly see, right? This is that's the amount of text. That's it. That's that's what I read. Uh, and in Dracula, um, you don't even really see it. This is. Um, it's not actually in in Dracula. It's literally one sentence, right? They learned to see. That's why I didn't remember it. Yes, they. You know, it's literally von Helsing is telling everybody about how how you know scary and terrible Dracula, who obviously Vlad Dracul is his inspiration, and he basically says. You know, they they um, had dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Skolomonts amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar is his due. And that's it. There um, you go. But there's in the annotated book, and my my aunt and uncle had this book, so that's how I got to. I, I read this again at their house, like at Thanksgiving one year or something like that. Um, and that. And that's it, you know, two paragraphs. That's not, and yet those two paragraphs and that image, the image of the school where the scholars are in the dark, where the 10th, where literally you've got these 10 scholars and they are all gambling, right? They're all literally gambling everything that they are, their souls, their lives, everything, um, just to gain knowledge. Right. And the questions of and that sort of viscerally stuck with me because and the Skolomots was so clearly not a human place. You know, they're literally in the pitch dark, that image, that that visual image of the scholars like standing where you can't even see their faces. Um, and the description said that basically there were no teachers and their their answers to their questions appeared in the dark as glowing letters of flame. And those that imagery, again, stuck in my head. And then obviously, um, many years later, I read Harry Potter, um, which itself is, of course, building on the classic school wizard school trope. And that itself is built on the classic boarding school trope, which itself is built on, right, it's all about the process of becoming, it's all about the process of becoming an adult through this experience of separation from your family um, and, and that kind of finding yourself and developing who you are uh, in, this kind of, in this kind of isolation. And those things, those things all sort of end up mashing themselves together. And that's where where the concept really came from. Yeah, yeah, and it, it does have a lot of the classic English boarding school tropes in it because you've got the maintenance track kids, which are kind of like the scholarship kids in the classic British stories. Uh, you know, there's yeah, a I mean, of course, this is this is the thing about the Scalamonts that literally almost most of the children are effectively, you know, uh, as Galadriel uh, refers to herself as, as one of these loser kids, as opposed to the enclave kids who, and, and of course the Scalamonts, right? It's an engine of exploitation because, you know, the foundation of this universe is that magic isn't free, that magic has a cost, that you need mana, you need power in order to make magic work. And you have to build it through effort. And the only way to get it is through your own effort, through your own sort of energy and work, unless you can get somebody else to do work for you, right? But, you know, that sort of, and and obviously the Enclaver kids have all these advantages, not just of 
um, not just that they have, that they come in with more resources, but they come in with the ability to effectively exploit the other kids. Uh, and, you know, obviously the, the name, A Deadly Education, the title is quite literal, right? In that, yeah. you know, the, the Scalamont's the legend is one in 10, right? And I sort of up the ante even further. <laughs> Uh, which is that one in four, that's, it's three out of four who get taken, who get killed. And it's only, you know, your, your odds of surviving are basically 25%. Um, yeah. But that's, that's not actually true because the enclavers have about an 80% chance of survival. Yeah. And so, yes, exactly. And, and obviously that's, that's a large piece of what it's about. Um, you know, that, that, and the way in which all of them are children enmeshed in the system that they did not build, but which many of them are, in, which they are in fact supporting, which they are quite literally holding up um, by continuing to sort of believe in it and participate in it. Oh, how about this? Why don't you uh, read us some from, uh, I guess, Deadly Education? Yes. Uh, yeah, I will. I will read. I'll read from the beginning um, because I feel great. like that's, that's always the way I I start. Yeah, um, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about, about L. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, chapter one: Soul Eater. I decided that Orion needed to die after the second time he saved my life. I hadn't really cared much about him before then, one way or another, but I had limits. It would have been all right if he'd saved my life some really extraordinary number of times, 10 or 13 or so. 13 is a number with distinction. Orion Lake, my personal bodyguard, I could have lived with that. But we'd been in the Scalamonts almost three years by then, and he hadn't shown any previous inclination to single me out for special treatment. Selfish of me, you'll say, to be contemplating with murderous intent the hero responsible for the continued survival of a quarter of our class. Well, too bad for the losers who couldn't stay afloat without his help. We're not meant to all survive anyway. The school has to be fed somehow. Ah, but what about me, you ask, since I'd needed him to save me? Twice, even. And that's exactly why he had to go. He set off the explosion in the alchemy lab last year, fighting that chimera. I had to dig myself out of the rubble while he ran around in circles, whacking at its fire-breathing tail. And that soul eater hadn't been in my room for five seconds before he came through the door. He must have been right on its heels, probably chasing it down the hall. The thing had only swerved in here looking to escape. But who's going to let me explain any of that? The chimera might not have stuck to me. There were more than 30 kids in the lab that day. But a dramatic rescue in my bedchamber is on another level. As far as the rest of the school is concerned, I've just fallen into the general mass of hapless warts that Orion Lake has saved in the course of his brilliant progress. And that was intolerable. Our rooms aren't very big. He was only a few steps from my desk chair, still hunched panting over the bubbling purplish smear of the soul eater that was now steadily oozing into the narrow cracks between the floor tiles, the better to spread all over my room. The fading incandescence on his hands was illuminating his face. Not an extraordinary face or anything. He had a big beaky nose that would maybe be dramatic one day when the rest of his face caught up. But for now was just too large. And his forehead was dripping sweat and plastered with his silver gray hair that he hadn't cut for three weeks too long. He spends most of his time behind an impenetrable shell of devoted admirers. So it was the closest I'd ever been to him. He straightened and wiped an arm across the sweat. You okay, gal, right? He said to me, just to put some salt on the wound. We've been in the same lab section for three years. No thanks to you and your boundless fascination for every dark thing creeping through the place, I said icily. And it is not gal. It has never been gal. It's Galadriel. And the name wasn't my idea, so don't look at me. And if that's too many syllables for you to manage all in one go, L will do. His head had jerked up and he was blinking at me in a sort of open-mouthed way. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, he said, voice rising on the words as if he didn't understand what was going on. No, no, I said, 
I'm sorry. Clearly, I'm not performing my role up to standard. I threw a melodramatic hand up against my forehead. Orion, I was so terrified, I gasped and flung myself onto him. He tottered a bit. We were the same height. Thank goodness you were here to save me. I could never have managed a soul eater all on my own. And I hiccuped a pathetically fake sob against his chest. Would you believe he actually tried to put his arm round me and give my shoulder a pat? That's how automatic it was for him. I jammed my elbow into his stomach to shove him off. He made a noise like a woofing dog and stared back to gawk at me. I don't need your help, you insufferable lurker, I said. Keep away from me or you'll be sorry. I shoved him back one more step and slammed the door shut between us, clearing the end of that beaky nose by bare centimeters. I had the brief satisfaction of seeing a look of perfect confusion on his face before it vanished away. And then I was left with only the bare metal door with the big melted hole where the doorknob and lock used to be. Thanks, hero. I glared at it and turned back to my desk, just as the blob of Soul Eater collapsed the rest of the way, hissing like a leaky steam pipe, and a truly putrescent stink filled the room. <laughs> yes, and then she has to clean up. Mm. Yes, which is not easy, um, because of which, no. yeah, that's no. not that's not her character. Because of right. because of who she is. <laughs> And what she's like. Let's just, we just met Gladriel, we just met Elle. Let's talk about her a little bit because she's not really very nice as, as we first meet her. Yes. She's, no, you know, it's, um, and, and, for, right. and for reasons. Right. Uh, you know, that um, there's there's that wonderful line in um, Into the Woods, you know, the Sondheim musical where it's like, nice is not, nice is not good. <laughs> good and nice are not the same thing. Um, and, and, uh, and right, and the thing is, of course, L. Um, you know, one of the the key things about uh, obviously the story, the other piece, the other trope that the the books are playing with, of course, is the chosen one trope, which is again a fundamental part of Harry Potter. It's also obviously, you know, everybody knows it sort of from Star Wars, right? It's that that sort of that quote unquote hero's journey where you have this one heroic sort of figure with sort of mysterious inborn power um, that they didn't choose, have done nothing obvious to deserve, and yet um, are sort of destined to, to live with, to, to sort of perform some heroic destiny. Uh, and, and usually it's to, to save everyone, to be the right. great savior. And right. Galadriel... Right. Well, yes. so obviously, you know, here we've got two different chosen ones. You've got Orion, who seems like the classic chosen one, the hero, and L, who is sort of seems to be chosen in a way to be his antagonist, to be his his opposite, um, and who's been given, uh, who's sort of laboring under this this prophecy of of destruction, uh, of mass destruction, and whose natural sort of talent, whose natural sort of affinity for magic is um, is essentially this idea of, uh, of being effectively a dark sorceress, that she's imbued with, with the sort of natural talent for sort of mass, not, not sort of, you know, combat, but literally like slaughtering vast walls um, of, of people. And that's, and so that you know, obviously, the next this the rest of the scene is she gets she's trying to clean her room, and she gets like five spells in a row. That's like enslave an entire mob. Who will then clean your room? Clean your room. Um, or summon you know walls of towering walls of flame that will kill everybody in the hallway. But scour your room very effectively. Um, and she's just like, I just want to mop the floor, <laughs> right? Uh, which you know she's. She and and so obviously she is somebody who is trying to remain human, right? To remain on, to not just she's trying to stay on the human scale, right? Um, even though effectively everything around her is conspiring to try and push her out of that scale. And her upbringing was difficult um, because she has this kind of affinity for mass destruction 
And her mother is this very nice, sweet, blonde Welsh hippie. And I was interested in why you had the little thing of yurts and the hippie little commune out in Wales. Yeah. Um, <laughs> instead of the American Southwest or something. Uh, that was interesting. And her father is from India. And when she goes to her father's family, her grandmother, her great grandmother, is horrified by her. Well, and obviously, so, you know, some of this stuff, obviously, this this obviously gets explored a lot more uh, in the later books. Yeah. And, um, and one of the key things, of course, about Galadriel, right, is that she is not, you know, Elle is not a reliable narrator in the sense yes. that, right, she is... I love that, by the way. <laughs> uh, in that... She she talks a much better game about um, being sort of heartless and you know self interested and um, and and not minding isolation etc. Then and being strategic and cold than she actually accomplishes. And of course, the reason for that is she is trying to survive, uh, and she is trying to survive a situation that uh, a, that is not. Right, that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of the Kobayashi Maru, right? It's the test that you are, right? The test that we all fail, um, the test of becoming who you are, becoming the best person you you can be, and um, and trying to become a person that you want to be, you know, sort of envisioning the person that you want to be and growing into that shape, and. Um, the ways in which, right, it feels often like the world doesn't let you do that. And that I feel is is just a classic experience, right? Something that we all on some level identify with. And obviously in the Scalamans, it's it's amplified because the stakes are amplified um, to, a, to a tremendous degree. And so Galadriel Elle is really in this place where she is so isolated even within the terrible isolation. She is, um, you know, because of her power, people can sense her power and, um, and they are afraid of her in many ways. And, you know, why that is, is something that is not necessarily going to be clear, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't wanna spoil anything, right? So it's not there. There's so, so there's complicated reasons for why, right? Um, and yet, it's not something that she can control. Um, and you know, at the same time, so that isolates her even more. That she's not able to make friends. That she's not able to have. Um, you know, for me, one of the key things about L is that. She has almost no place to stand. She has essentially been denied community um, her whole life in every possible direction. And so she literally is sort of standing in, in this place that her parents made, um, that her parents essentially sort of the two of them kind of having their arms around her. And it's literally this one place where she can stand um, and the one place where she can exist. And at the same time, and, and you know, she, and as you would expect, she, she deeply resents the isolation. She doesn't feel, she feels it's deeply unfair as you would, and it is unfair. And so, and at the same time, um, she, she is, she still, she's, she's in a way, she's caught in that place. She doesn't want to stop being who she is. Right, and that's the that's the key about Elle to me. Right, that she she has a strong enough sense of herself that she isn't she isn't going to destroy herself in order to break her isolation. Um, but at the same time, that's a terrible that's a very scary thing because literally the punishment for being isolated in the Skullmonts is death. Um, and, not, and not a pleasant death. No. Um, and Fact, you came up with some pretty 
dark monsters and ways of dying. This is a much darker book in a lot of ways than your other work. Yeah, um, because it did, to me, that's the fundamental thing about the Skolomans. You know, when you read the folklore, it sort of makes it sound like this cool, you know, dark, edgy, mysterious, dark school, right? Uh, and, and wizard schools traditionally are these places of wonder, right? Hogwarts, you know, you're given this sense of, of like, it's this place of, of joy, right? It's, it's the place that even Voldemort loves, right? <laughs> Um, and yet this, but the key for me about the Scalamonts is that the price it demands is so horrific, right? That you can't possibly choose to go to the Scalamonts, that it had to be, you know, that I, it felt to me that that was the key about the Scalamonts, that the choice to go to the Scalamonts, uh, in the, in the folklore, right? The choice to go to a place, a school, where you have a one in 10 chance of literally being unmade, of literally being taken by the devil, destroyed in this fundamental way, that only, only something truly, that people who would do that voluntarily, there would have to be something truly terribly wrong with them. That in fact, I didn't believe in it. I did not believe in the, in the legend. I didn't believe that any real human being would voluntarily go and do that to themselves. So then the question for me in my work became, what would make you do it? What would drive you to it? It can't be voluntary. It has to basically be that it's worse on the outside, that um, and that's why parents send their children. That's why children go, because they don't have a better choice. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's the world you built, because yeah. this has some really nice world building in it, because yeah. it, it and it works. You understand why parents are sending their kids there. It's because like it's the only chance they got. Right. Right. And, you know, one of the one of the wonderful things I'm going to I'm going to show this piece off, which is we, made, we got blueprints made of the school. Um, yeah. Right. Which the you know, the idea is that obviously this is the school and you can see it sort of looks almost like a screw. And there's this spoke down the middle and way down here off the state off the screen, basically, is where the only entrance to the school is. And effectively. You know, it's the principle behind the design of, of any kind of fortress, right? You bottleneck, you create the bottleneck so that the monsters have a really hard time getting in and getting at the kids who are in. Uh, and the, the fundamental idea is that there's a period of vulnerability for these kids that um, when your, your ability to store mana uh, at, you, you enter puberty, your ability to store mana starts to increase. And there's a point where you have the ability to store enough mana that you look very tasty to the monsters, but you don't yet have the power and the control to actually defend yourself. And then by the time you are essentially an adult, by the time you sort of reach the end of puberty and you've trained aggressively during that time period, you come out and you both have the mana and you also have so much magical power and ability that you can defend yourself out in the wide world. Uh, yeah. But that there's this period of time in which the children, children are so vulnerable that even in enclaves, even in the best protective places that wizards can have, um, there's just too much access. The monsters can get them. And that's, that's the the reason why parents send their kids to the scholars. Yeah, and I also like the way they they start higher up in the building, and then are moved down. And it's a, and it's a nice combination of kind of magic and not technology but engineering. construction engineering. Right. Yeah. Right. A better yeah. word yeah. of how it all works, and there's there's scenes where they you see the school moving and changing. Right. Um, and, and, you, know, you asked you asked one you asked a question like why the UK? Why is Galadriel from the UK? Um, and that's partly because in fact I knew Orion was from New York, and I knew I needed the US and the UK in that 
um, I felt quite early on, right, the Scalamance is not sort of like a medieval, it's not a medieval thing. It's, uh, it's an industrial revolution thing, right? It is this engine on a titanic scale. It's about the mass, it's a, an engine of exploitation. It's about the mass exploitation. Um, it's about, you know, that sort of industrial process, this, this huge machine that sort of chews people up. And obviously that happens in the UK. And I knew that the school had to be started um, in the UK because of that. And then obviously it sort of eventually comes, hands over, right? After the, in the post-war period that effectively gets transferred to the US. And that whole, um, that whole process, right? Uh, is the one that um, is part of what it's talking about, you know, and and so that was quite fundamental. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got up right now a special website mm -hmm. that you have for the Scholomance, enter.thescholomance.com, which is up yeah. on the screen now. Um, and that is a, that's not your regular website. That is a special right. website for this series, right? Yes, um, and it's a more or less in-universe website. Like it's basically, um, we're still working on it, but it's basically the school website for the scholar, <laughs> right? The scholar months, you know, because it's it's it is not exactly in our world, but it's our world, um, and uh, and so they the internet exists, you know, the kids kids have cell phones or whatever. Um, and they uh, and their websites and the school has its own website, um, which obviously they can have it in plain sight because mundanes aren't going to believe in it, um, you know. Uh, and and there's some there's some fun things that we're we're already have on there and that we are planning. I'm planning to do more with it, and it's just it's one of those things where time ran out for me to <laughs> do as much with it as I wanted to. But but there's still some fun things there. Yeah, there's only so much time in a day, and you've got a kid, you've got a family, and you've got a regular life, <laughs> up to a point. Yeah, no, and 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 other books that are due. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, you talked about mana, but there's also the darker side. The, the was it Malia? Malia, and yeah. The Malificars. Malificars. Yeah. Um, I. You know, I actually, I, I, I'm not, I don't pronounce things correctly typically <laughs> because I grew up, um, I grew up speaking Polish, which stresses a different syllable than English. So for a long time, and you know, as the child of immigrants, right, I, um, I, I read a lot of words that I never heard at home and I made up pronunciations for them and all my made up pronunciations were wrong. So that said, um, the, you know, the Maleficaria and the Malef Maleficers, um, it's all, right, it all comes from the same root, which is malice, maliciousness. And this essentially, in this universe, right, is defined as, um, you know, Malia is power that's not yours, power that you didn't build for yourself. Um, and you know, you can be given power freely by someone else, uh, or you can try and take it from people. And there are some wizards, right, who deliberately essentially become malicious, which are the same way that the, the monsters, the Maleficaria do. And they stop making their own mana and just start taking mana from other people and other wizards. And that, you know, the, the act of taking it with violence, right, is, is sort of the obvious way uh, and causes certain kinds of psychic damage and corruption to the person doing it. Um, except, obviously, you know, and this is something that's, that's sort of a key piece of the books, which is that's that's not what the, you know, enclavers, for instance, are doing when they get mana from other kids. They are being given that mana more or less freely. Um, the other kids are giving it to them, choosing to give it to them. But uh, it's, you know, that's not just, 
it's not that they're not, those kids aren't doing it in a, in a sort of truly willing way. It's not a truly willing gift. It's just, it's a gift that's not causing you psychic damage um, on the surface, but you're, you know, it's, it's exploitation, which is, you know, you're, you're sort of, you can trick people, you can lie to people, you can threaten people, you can, you know, do all sorts of things to make them give you power that isn't literally like stabbing them. Um, but, uh, but so there's the obvious kinds of Malia and then there's the less obvious kinds. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other characters. Um, I found Orion to be really interesting because the way you learn more about him and the way he kind of changes in, in our minds as the book goes on was like really nicely done. He's, you know, he starts kind of insufferable and then you realize it ain't that easy for him. Right. Right. And obviously, you know, it's sort of the the flip side of, of Elle's experience, right? Where she yeah. is um, utterly isolated on her side. And he is utterly, she is utterly isolated by avoidance. And he's utterly isolated by sort of, you know, uh, uh, literally the crowd, right? You know, Elle speaks of him in irritation is surrounded by this impenetrable shell of devoted admirers. She's not wrong, right? Yeah. It's, it's an impenetrable shell. And he literally is like sort of swarm. Um, and of course he is in, and one of the, you know, that's one of the things about Elle that she, um, she doesn't see Orion clearly at the beginning. Uh, he's not a real, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't know, she doesn't see him as a person, and then she gradually does. And that's how we get to see what's going on with him. Um, yeah. But yeah, but, but he is, and you know, obviously that's the thing, is the chosen one role, and I'm just, this is something that you see a lot, right, which is what does it mean to be the chosen one? Um, what does it mean to be chosen to be a hero? You, who chose, right? That that implies that there's a choosing. There is somebody doing the choosing. Who's choosing, and why, and what they what are they actually choosing, and what if that's not your choice? What does it imply for your choices as the chosen one? Uh, if if you don't get to to choose to be the chosen one, um, and that. And that sort of grappling with destiny um, is a question, it, and it's a question as much for him as it is for Elle. Yeah. And I, I love the fact that, you know, she treats him like crap. And <laughs> he's one of the few people, she's one of the few people he actually likes because, because she treats him like crap, because she's not hero worshiping him. She right. treats him like she treats everybody else, like crap. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, the thing is, right, the, the key is that she refuses his help. Yes. Right? She says, no, I don't want your help, um, which is she refuses to, to be beholden. She refuses to sort of need him. And, and that's why... He, uh, and that's why he can, uh, he can care about her in a way. That's why, that's one of the reasons why. Um, I mean, obviously it's, it's much more complicated. It, there's, yeah. no, there's no single reason it's, but, but that's. This is not a simple, reason. straightforward book. It's, it's yeah. a very complicated, twisty book. The characters are like all have motives like people have. I mean, her friends, Lou and Adaya. Um, they're, well, they become friends, but at right. the beginning, they're more like people that don't hate her. Right. <laughs> that right. she can work people with. People who because, literally will like, we'll, we'll talk to her occasionally. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll sit with her in the cafeteria, which right. was great. The cafeteria is a trip. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I do think that, right, the, um, that's an experience that I think a lot of us carry with us. You know, that that sort of sense of trauma of like, who am I going to sit with 
and who will will they let me sit with them will they let me will they talk to me will they right um can i find can i find the other the table that has the other geeks in it right <laughs> right and uh and that that sense obviously which is amplified in the skull Mons to where it is in fact you know as as l puts an act of war um and and it's in that it's it's all about strategy because the people you get to talk to are the people who might ask you to be in your in their graduation alliance uh and that's yeah so that's obviously the the thing that's running through all their heads all the time um yeah. as you sort of think it would be yeah yeah well naomi we are out of time i could sit and talk to you about all this stuff and your other books and everything for hours and hours but we we can't do that um Alas. i want to yeah, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to visit us here. Um, and I have to remind people to go down to somewhere around on the screen and subscribe to us on YouTube, like this video, because that's important to us. If you click the bell, then you'll get told when we've got more faster forward things going on. And we've been showing you links to Naomi's various social media and sites. We'll put we'll put all that and more of them, like her Instagram, uh, down in the comments below. Uh, thanks for joining us, Naomi. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your taking lovely, time. lovely as always. I'm always happy. Yeah, it's always fun to talk to you. Well, this is Mike Zipser from Fast Forward telling everybody out there to take care, stay safe, wash your damn hands. Bye-bye.